Hey, hooligans, and welcome bu -bu 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 back for some more Shelton shenanigans. So, we are here today to read chapter Cinco, chapter five of Hatchet by Gary Paulson. So, remember, up until this point, Brian in a plane. Plane, or pilot, didn't make it. And the plane crashed into the lake. He made it out, thank goodness. And um, he's just now sitting at the bottom of a tree. He's just kind of like looking out of the lake. He fell asleep because he was just so tired. Because remember, he didn't, he almost didn't make it out from the swim. So we're really getting into the good parts of the book. So stay tuned. Be sure you're listening extra careful for the secret thing I'm going to tell you to comment at some point in the video. Be sure you comment your name and the secret thing, or you can write it on a piece of paper and bring it to me Monday, but it would be so much easier if you could just comment below with your name and the answer to whatever the secret thing is. These haven't been hard, so hopefully y'all are enjoying it. It's adding a little pizzazz, a little sparkle to the read aloud experience. So sit back and enjoy, and let's get to get to get to da, 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 da. let's start the video. Okay, guess who's back? Back, back, back again. Michelle Tins back, back, back with that. <laughs> To read again. Chapter five. All right, that was lame. We're just going to pretend I didn't do that. We're back with chapter five. All right, so where we left Brian was asleep, hunched over uh, on a tree facing the lake. His eyes snapped open, hammered open, and there were things, these things about himself that he knew instantly. He was unbelievably, viciously thirsty. His mouth was dry and tasted foul and sticky. His lips were cracked and felt as if they were bleeding. If he didn't, and if he, he knew if he did not drink some water soon, he felt that he would wither up and die. Lots of water, all the water he could find. He knew the thirst and felt the burn on his face. It was mid-afternoon and the sun had come over him and cooked him while he slept and his face was on fire. Would blister, would peel, which would not help the thirst, made it much worse. He stood using the tree to pull himself up because there was still some pain and much stiffness and looked down at the lake. So he fell asleep, hunched over at night on this tree and woke up mid afternoon and was sunburned, which makes you dehydrated. And he was already dehydrated. So he needed some water quickly. So he had looked down at the lake. It was water, but he did not know if he could drink it. Nobody had ever told him if you could or could not drink lake water. There was also the thought of the pilot down in the blue water with the plane, strapped in the body. Ugh, awful, he thought, but the lake was blue and wet looking and his mouth and throat raged with the thirst and he did not know where there might be another form of water he could possibly drink. Besides, he had probably swallowed a ton of it while he was swimming out of the plane and getting to shore. In the movies, they always seem to show the hero finding a clear spring with pure sweet water to drink. But in the movies, they didn't have plane wrecks and swollen foreheads and aching bodies and thirst that tore into the hero until he couldn't think straight. Brian took small steps down the bank to the lake. Along the edge, there were thick grasses and the water looked a little murky. That means a little dirty, a little murky. And there were small things swimming in the water, small bugs. But there was a log extending about 20 feet out into the, it, into the water out of the lake. A beaver drop from some time before with old limbs sticking up, almost like handles. He balanced on the log, holding himself up with the limbs and teetered out past the weeds and murky water. When he was out where the water was clear and he could see no bugs swimming, he kneeled on the log to drink. A sip, he thought, still worrying about the lake water. I'll just take a sip. But when he, br but when he brought a cupped hand to his mouth and felt the cold lake water trickle past his cracked lips and over his tongue, he couldn't stop. He had never, not even on the long bike trips in the hot summer, had ever been this thirsty. It was as if the water were more than water, as if the water had become all of life, and he couldn't stop himself. He stooped and put his mouth directly to the lake and drank and drank and drank, pulling in deep and swallowing great gulps of it. He drank until his stomach was swollen, until he nearly fell off the log with it. And then he rose and staggered, tripped his way back to the bank where he was immediately sick and threw up most of the water. But his thirst was gone, and the water seemed to reduce the pain in his head as well, although the sunburn still cooked his face. So, 
Oh, he almost jumped with the word, spoken aloud. It seemed so out of place. The sound, he tried again. So, so, so here I am. And there it was, he thought. For the first time since the crash, his mind started to work. His brain triggered and he began thinking. Here I am. And where is that? Where am I? He pulled himself once more to the bank, to the tall tree without branches, and sat again with his back against the rough bark. It was hot now, but the sun was high to, and to his rear, and he sat in the shade of the tree in relative comfort. There were things to sort out. Here I am, and that is nowhere. With his mind opened and thoughts happening, it all tried to come in with a rush. All of what occurred, but he could not take it. The whole thing turned into a confused jumble that made no sense. So he fought it down and tried to take one thing at a time. He had been flying north to visit his father for a couple of months in the summer. And the pilot had had a heart attack and then he had died. And then the plane had crashed somewhere in the Canadian Northwoods, but he did not know how far they had flown or in what direction he was. Slow down, he thought. Slow down. My, my phone tried it. It tried it. Slow down, he thought. Slow down more. Whew. My name is Brian Robeson, and I'm 13 years old, and I am alone in the North Woods of Canada. All right, he thought. That's simple enough. I was flying to visit my father, and the plane crashed and sank in a lake. There, keep it that way. Short, sweet thoughts. I do not know where I am, which doesn't mean, mean much. More to the point, they do not know where I am. They meaning anybody who might be wanting to look for me. The searchers. They would look for him, look for the plane. His mother and father would be frantic. They would tear the world apart to find him. Brian had seen searches on the news, seen movies about lost planes. And when a plane went down, they mounted extensive searches and almost always found the plane within a day or two. Pilots all filed flight plans, a detailed plan for when and where they were going to fly with all the courses explained. They would come. They would look for him. Their searchers would get the government planes and cover both sides of the flight plan filed by the government and search until they found him. So a flight plan basically is like a map. The pilot's like, all right, I'm going to pick him up here and we're going to end up here and we're going to fly straight this way through this, you know, on this, in this direction. So he was saying that he was like, I don't even know where the flight plan was supposed to look like before, let alone after it got jerked. So he really has no idea where he is. Also, this is a great time for our drum roll, please. Secret thing to put in the comments. So, I want to know, have you ever been lost? Maybe lost in a store, maybe lost, I don't know, in the dark, maybe you got lost in the playground, wandered off. Have you ever been lost and how did you feel? Was it scary? So be sure you put your name and like one sentence, it does not have to be bougie. Just put something in the comments like, yes, I was lost, I got lost at Walmart. I know when I was little, I got lost in Best Buy, Best Buy, scariest thing ever. So have you ever been lost in a store or lost somewhere else? Tell me in the comments below or write it on your piece of paper, but it would be much easier if you commented it. So be sure you put your name and that in the comments below. Back to the book. Okay. They would have started, start, started the search immediately. Wrong part. The searchers would get the government plans and cover both sides of the flight plan filed by the pilot and search until they found him. Maybe even today. They might come today. This was the second day after the crash. No. Brian frowned. Was it the first day or the second day? They had gone down in the afternoon and he had spent the whole night out cold. So this was the first real day. But they could still come today. They would have started the search immediately when Brian's plane did not arrive. Y'all, imagine if you were on a plane and your father was waiting and then you didn't show up. I'm sure the worst nightmare for a parent. Yeah, they would probably come today. Probably come in here with an amphibious, with amphibious planes. That is a great word, amphibious planes. So an amphibian, remember, is like a um, frog. So it starts off in the water and then ends up in the, on the land. So an amphibious plane, think about it, keep listening. Probably come in here with amphibious planes, small small bush bush planes with floats that could land right here on the lake and pick them up and take them home. What a good name for those planes. Oh God, which home? The father home or the mother home? He stopped the thinking. It didn't matter. Either on to his dad or back to his mother. Either way, he would probably be home by late tonight or early morning. 
home where he could sit down and eat a large, juicy, cheesy, ju juicy burger with tomatoes and double fries with ketchup and a thick chocolate malt. And there came hunger. Brian rubbed his stomach. Oh, the hunger had been there, but something else, something bigger, fear or pain, had held it down. Now, with the thought of the burger, the emptiness roared at him. He could not believe this hunger, had never felt it this way. The lake water had filled his stomach, but left it hungry, and now it demanded food, screamed for food. And there it was, he thought, absolutely nothing to eat, nothing. What did they do in the movies when they got stranded like this? Oh, yes, the hero usually found some kind of a plant that he, knew was that he somehow knew was just good to eat, and that took care of it. Just ate the plant until he was full or until he used some kind of cute little trap to catch an animal and cook it over a nice slick little fire. And pretty soon he had a full eight course meal. That really is how they make it look in the movies. The trouble, Brian thought, looking around, was that all he could see was grass and brush. There was nothing obvious to eat. And aside from about a million birds and the beaver, he hadn't seen any animals that he could trap or cook. And even if he got one somehow, he didn't have any matches, so he didn't have fire. Nothing. It kept coming back to that. He had nothing. Well, almost nothing. As a matter of fact, he thought, I don't know what I've got or haven't got. Maybe I should try and figure out how I stand. It will give me something to do. Keep me from thinking about food until they come and find me later. Brian once had an English teacher, a guy named Perpich, who always talked about being positive, thinking positive, staying on top of things. That's how Perpich had put it. Stay positive and stay on top of things. Brian thought of him now, wondered how to stay positive and stay on top of this. All Perpich would say is, I have to get motivated. He was always telling kids to get motivated. Brian changed position, so he was sitting on, sitting on his knees. He reached into his pockets and took out everything he had and laid it on the grass in front of him. It was pitiful enough. A quarter, three dimes, a nickel, and two pennies. Is that money going to do him any good in the forest? No. A fingernail clipper, a billfold with a $20 bill, in case you get stranded at the airport in some small town and have to buy food, his mother had said, and some odd pieces of paper. That $20 bill is not going to help him because that's not where he's stranded. There's not exactly a McDonald's near the um, middle of the northern woods of Canada. And on his belt, somehow still there, the hatchet his mother had given him. He had forgotten it and now reached around and took it out and put it in the grass. There was a touch of rust already forming on the cutting edge of the blade, and he rubbed it off with his thumbs. That was it. He frowned. No, wait. If he was going to play the game, might as well play it right. Perpich would tell him to quit messing around. Get motivated. Look at all of it, Robeson. He had on a pair of good tennis shoes, now almost dry, and socks and jeans and underwear and a thin leather belt and a t-shirt with a windbreaker so torn it hung on him in tatters. And a watch. He had a digital watch still on his wrist, but it was broken from the crash. The little screen blank, and he took it off and almost threw it away, but stopped the hand motion and lay it on the grass with the rest of it. There, that was it. No wait, one other thing. These were all the things he had, but he also had himself. Perpich used to drum that into them. You are your most valuable asset. Don't forget that. You are the best thing you have. Good advice. Brian looked around again. Oh, I wish you were here, Perpich. I'm hungry and I'd trade anything to have a hamburger. I'm hungry, he said it aloud, in normal tones at first, then louder and louder until he was yelling it. I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. When he stopped, there was a sudden silence, not just from him, but the clicks and blurps and bird sounds of the forest as well. The noise of his voice had startled everything and it was quiet. He looked around, listening with his mouth open, and realized that in all his life he had never heard silence before. Complete silence. There had always been some sound. Some kind of sound. It only lasted a few seconds, but it was so intense that it seemed to become a part of him. Nothing. There was no sound. Then the bird started again, and some kind of buzzing insect, and then a chattering and a cawing, and soon there was the same background of sound, which left him still hungry. Of course, he thought, putting the coins and the, rest, and the rest back in his pocket and the hatchet in his belt. Of course, if they come tonight, or even if they take as long as tomorrow, the hunger is no big thing. People have gone for many days without food as long as they've got water. Even if they don't come until late tomorrow, I'll be all right. Lose a little weight, maybe. 
but the first hamburger and a malt and fries will bring it right back. The mental picture of a hamburger, the way they showed it on the television commercials, thundered into his thoughts. Rich colors, the meat juicy and hot. He pushed the picture away. So even if they didn't find him until tomorrow, he thought, he would be all right. He had plenty of water, although he wasn't sure if it was good or clean or not. He sat again by the tree, his back against it. There was a thing bothering him. He wasn't quite sure what it was, but it kept chewing at the edge of his thoughts. Something about the plane and the pilot that would change things. Ah, there it was. The moment when the pilot had his heart attack, his right foot had jerked on the rudder pedal and the plane had slewed sideways. What did that mean? Why did that keep coming into his thinking that way and nudging and pushing? It means, a voice in his head, a voice in his thoughts said, that they might not be coming for you tonight or even tomorrow. When the pilot pushed the rudder pedal and the plane jerked to the side, it assumed a new course. Brian could not remember how much it had pulled around, but it would have had to have been, but it wouldn't have had to have been much because after that, with the pilot dead, Brian had flown for an out for hours after hours on the new course. Well away from the flight plan the pilot had filed. Many hours at maybe 160 miles an hour. Even if it was only a little off course, with that speed and time, Brian might be now sitting several hundred miles off to the side of the recorded flight plan. So if this is the flight plan and they're like, okay, this is where we're starting and this is where we're ending. So if Brian made it, to pretend like this, like the top of my head is the start. So if they started here and the pilot had a heart attack, like right here, even if he had a heart attack, cause they were going straight, even if he had a heart attack and it went boop, just a little to the side, instead of ending up at the beginning of my, at the top of my forehead, if he went boop, he is now going all the way over here. Cause Brian went for miles and miles, hours and hours, possibly in the wrong direction. They would probably search most heavily at first along the flight plan course. They might go out to the side a little to each direction, but he could easily be three, 400 miles to the side of the recorded course. He could not know, could not think of how far he might have flown wrong because he didn't know the original course and didn't know how much they had pulled sideways when he had jerked the, when he had jerked the rudder pedal. Quite a bit, that's how he remembered it. Quite a jerk to the side, and it pulled. It had pulled his head over sharply when the plane had swung around. They might not find him for two or three days. He felt his heartbeat increasing as the fear started. The thought was there, but he fought it down for a time, pushed it away, and then it exploded out. They might not find him for a long time. And the next thought was there as well, that they might never find him. But that was panic, and he fought it down and tried to stay positive. They searched hard when a plane went down. They used many men and planes and they would go off to the side. They would know they would know he was off from the flight plan. He had talked to the man on the radio. They would somehow know it would be all right. They would soon find him. Maybe not tomorrow, but soon, soon, soon. They would find him soon. Gradually, like sloshing oil, his thoughts settled back and the panic was gone. Say they didn't come for two days. No, say they didn't come for three days. Even push that to four days. He could live with that. He would have to live with that. He didn't want to think of them taking longer. But say four days. He had to do something. He couldn't just sit at the bottom of this tree and stare out at the lake for four days. At night, he was deep in the woods and didn't have any matches. Couldn't make a fire. There were large things in the woods. There were wolves, he thought, and bears, other things. In the dark, he would be in the... In the dark... He would be in the open here, just sitting at the bottom of a tree. He looked around suddenly, felt the hair on the back of his neck go up. Things might be looking at him right now, waiting for him, waiting for dark so they could move in and take him. He fiddled with the hatchet at his belt. It was the only weapon he had, but it was something. He had to have some kind of shelter. No, make that more. He had to have some kind of shelter and he had to have something to eat. He pulled himself to his feet and jerked the back of his shirt down before the mosquitoes could get at it again. He had to do something to help himself. I have to get motivated, he thought, remembering Perpich. Right now I'm all I've got and I have to do something. Oh, such a good chapter. Such a good chapter. Y'all, look, we're doing good. We've read this much of the book. So, hopefully you enjoyed that chapter. I'm going to keep recording, so um, don't be surprised if you see me wearing the shirt for multiple videos. 
is because I'm filming them one after the other, not because I never change shirts. So um, be sure that you have watched all of the chapters that I um, told you to watch. Be sure that you have commented below each of the videos, the things that I secretly told you to comment or write them down if you don't have a YouTube account, but seriously, just create a YouTube account. It's 2021, it's not that hard. Create a YouTube account and comment below with your name and the answer to the super secret thing. And I will catch you guys in the next video. Stay groovy. Love y'all.